Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon, the Ruckheads join me shortly, and our topics this week is affordable housing affordable in Kansas City? Can Kansas afford two billion more for education? And can Republicans afford the loss of Congress, plus roast and toast? But we start with our newsmaker segment, take a look at streetcars and area transportation from a different perspective. Often coverage of the downtown streetcar and its potential expansion is effusive and positive, but as with all issues, there's another side, another point of view. To discuss the streetcar saga is attorney Sherry DeJanes, who thinks there are better ways to advance mass transit in Kansas City. Sherry, welcome back to Ruckus. Good to see you again. Thanks. Glad to be here. Let me start with a general question. As you know, KCPT has run a series on public works in Kansas City, one of which dealt with public transportation. Right. Talking about transportation in general. Give us your overview of how transportation is doing regionally, regionally and in Kansas City, Missouri, and what you'd like to see changed. Well, to begin with, I think that steps in the right direction are being taken. You've uh, probably noticed the smaller Ride KC buses that are being um, in various parts of the city. I think that will meet several needs that people have expressed. A lot of people talk to me about needing to get to places where not a lot of other people needed to get, but it was crucial to their employment, so those can be deployed for those purposes. There's more um, investment in terms of research and actual development going into applications like the Uber type app so that you can, the, the smaller buses, larger buses can be more interconnected. So I think it's headed in the right direction. I just hate to see any of those funds diverted to the streetcar and that's what's happening. So you're not opposed to public transportation, you're just opposed to the way it's being implemented. Right, no, we are very much supporters of of public transportation. Smart KC stands for Supporters of Modern Affordable Regional Transit. So we're not no for transit. Last time we talked, you were hoping to derail, if you will, the streetcar extension from Union Station to UMKC, but that election is still in progress and likely going to take place in June. Well, what's actually <coughs> happening is that people are now requesting ballots and they only have until 5 p.m. on April the 3rd to get those into the circuit court administrator's office or they will not be allowed to vote in June for the uh, funding piece of the election. So I really want people to understand that they need to get in touch with someone to get those ballots, get them faxed in, do not mail them now. And they could call us at 816-668 8447 will deploy someone to get the ballot for them and fax it if in. If the extension is approved ultimately, do you plan to uh, go to court to try to overturn it? Uh, that is certainly something that can be considered, but at the present we have an ongoing legal battle regarding the constitutionality of the mail-in balloting. The whole transportation district concept? Not the concept, but the form of mail-in balloting. They could have taken this to the ballot box, as they did in 2014 when they were resoundingly defeated. They've elected to go mail-in, as they did downtown. And, and you think that's a disadvantage to some of the voters? It absolutely disenfranchises large segments of the voting population, particularly the elderly and the low-income segments. I know you were in favor of this citywide vote requiring the city, broadly speaking, to vote on any future streetcar extensions. That was approved by voters, but just by a narrow margin. Is that going to be intact for future extension elections? Well, it is not intact now as it was passed by the public. The city council removed the planning aspect. What the um, ordinance had addressed after the initiative petition was passed was twofold. One, planning, and two, actual expenditures for infrastructure, purchase of lands, purchase of product. 
the city council eliminated the planning section and so the city can spend however much it wishes on planning future streetcar expansion. Last time you were here, I remember asking you if you'd ever been on the downtown streetcar and you said no. And I asked if you were planning to take a ride and you said no. I'll ask you again, have you been on the streetcar since the last time we talked? No. Uh, do you plan to take a ride on the downtown streetcar anytime soon? No, typically I need to be somewhere much more quickly than I can get there on the streetcar. All right, Sherry, thank you very much for coming in. Good to see you again. My pleasure. And that was attorney Sherry DeJanes. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. <music> Teresa Garza is a former Jackson County legislator. Steve Rose is a Johnson County civic leader and a Kansas City Star columnist. Jason Grill is the founder of J. Grill Media and a senior advisor at Paris Communications. And Crosby Kemper III is director of the Kansas City Library System and, of course, the host of KCPT's Meet the Past and Centropolis programs. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming in. A lot to discuss today. We'll start with this. The effort to remake downtown Kansas City has resulted in major changes that many find appropriate and attractive. The Sprint Center, the streetcar, the Power and Light District. But a shifting downtown also creates change that meets resistance. Think towering Cornish apartment structures, one light, two light, and in the planning stages, three light. Some on the city council tried to block the city's commitment to $17.5 million to finance three lights garage. They argue that too much money is spent on upscale apartments, while scant attention is paid to affordable housing. But by an 8-3 vote, the city council chose to continue funding for the garage, and one of our panelists reacted on social media, calling the three-light deal larger than the entire library's annual budget and three times the city's housing budget, insane public policy. By chance, was that treat from you? Yeah, it happened to be, it happened to be for me, and I also attended the city council with my signs. And, and uh, uh, look, I mean, it's just the garage that is larger than our budget at the library. It's three times larger, just the garage, which is a direct subsidy out of the general fund. Uh, just the garage is three times, more than three times what the city's annual housing budget is. So, and, and yeah, they keep making this argument about the, uh, we have to adhere to this 99 year contract we signed in 2004. They've amended it 13 times. In this agreement, they're, they're, uh, they're adding taxes, a sales tax, they're adding $3.9 million for affordable housing to subsidize Cordish and doing the affordable housing that Cordish had previously promised us. This is a, A, it's a terrible deal. B, it's incredibly regressive. We keep shifting tax dollars from the from the poorest people in town, the, or the average Kansas City taxpayer, to the wealthiest developers, uh, and it's time to stop this. Teresa, is there a counter argument to what he's saying? Uh, a deal is a deal is a deal. So I think um, you know your word is your bond to a certain degree, but at the same time, there are things in the toolbox that the city can use going forward that they need to be looking at, such as planning and zoning um, policies, economic development policies, housing policies, and I think that's one way to be addressed. What we do right now in the present is um, a whole other story because it is an existing contract, and yes, it has had amendments, but it's still at the same time, if somebody goes back on their word, you don't want to go back and continue to do business with them. Well, Steve, some on the city council who supported the uh, Seventeen and a half million dollars. Say the Cordish deal was done back, I think, in 2004, when there was little interest on the part of businesses to locate in Kansas City, and Cordish deserves respect for having been involved from the outset. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, I'm one who thinks that the subsidy that the city puts into the Power and Light District is probably the best money the city's ever spent. Oh, and yes, yeah, uh, Crosby, <laughs> if it weren't, if, if that hadn't been spent, you would still have you would still have haunted houses it's, in it's downtown the Kansas City. It's the amount of the subsidy. It was, it was a, a, a deal done behind the scenes. The, the city council voted on a contract they'd never seen, sort of typical. You, you would is. have to say as an historian that if you look back in Kansas City's chapter of history, that the revitalization of downtown was one of the most important 
significant events in the history of this city. And it wouldn't have happened without a subsidy. Yeah. I agree with that. It's just too much of a subsidy, and it's an ongoing subsidy. And we're up to hundreds of millions of dollars now, Steve. Compare this deal to deals in other cities. We get the worst deal because we didn't negotiate a good deal, and we're still not negotiating a good deal. We rolled over for them one more time. Well, so Jason, I, uh, the, the people who uh, supported the uh, $17.5 million were saying, that there is a compromise that Cordish is going to build affordable housing at right. a building that they own, the Midland office. The Midland, building. right. So they're going to put in 100 units, I believe, there. And that was kind of always part of their plan, I think, was to develop the Midland with uh, affordable housing. So that was seen as a compromise. But I agree. I think, I mean, back in 2004, obviously, uh, Kansas City and Louisville were the two cities that had dying downtowns. And I know Cordish stepped to the plate to build in those two cities. So. You know, maybe it's not the best deal, but at the same time, what do we have going for us back then? Yeah, and I think when we're talking about affordable housing, I mean, we're talking about people with incomes of 40 to about 40,000 to 80,000. So we're talking Workforce, teachers, nurses, yeah. um, you know, transportation drivers with the a uh, KCATA. We're talking uh, office administrators. We're talking firefighters, police officers. So we're talking middle income type families no, that no, are no, not no. being able to even pr be priced into the downtown. When I, so, when I quickly so, Googled, uh, affordable housing downtown blah 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 I got Miami I got Los Angeles I got Nashville all the, where there's these issues about affordable housing is there enough affordable housing I will tell you in every single case they are talking about a completely different kind Correct. of affordable housing than we're talking about here right. they are talking about housing that are keeping people away from being homeless and that's right. what's happening in Austin, right. Texas right now. So we spend our money on yuppies. I'm told not to use that right. word. It dates me. But this is yuppies <laughs> that we're just moving around the metro area and we're subsidizing them and Cordish, an out-of-town developer, where we're spending no money developing a true I housing can, policy can, for the poor, I can tell you that one people. light is full of a very diverse population because I live there. There's baby boomers, there's blacks, there's white, there's Indians, there's business people, there's... Uh, young people. I mean, it's a it's it's a very diverse community there. I, I I think that's getting lost in the whole shuffle. That there are people that live there from all different walks of life. Okay, thanks. Let's move on. In a recent column, Steve Rose warns Kansans not to equate massive increases for schools in the state to the two billion dollar court ordered spending in the Kansas City, Missouri school district that ended in 2003. The column notes several key distinctions. The Kansas City goal was desegregation. The Kansas plan, student achievement. The Kansas City effort was one school district. In Kansas, the effort will be statewide. Of course, all of this is predicated on the assumption that Kansas legislators will find the will and the way to massively increase the state's education budget, and the state Supreme Court will give its okay. Steve, how confident are you that's going to happen? Oh, it's going to happen because the Supreme Court's been very clear that if it doesn't happen by April the 30th and the legislature doesn't come up with a viable plan, they will, the schools will not open in the fall. Uh, the legislators say, oh, well, everybody's going to blame the courts. No, that's not the way it works. If you look at the polling, the Supreme Court is held in very high esteem, the legislature very low self -esteem. People will blame the legislators when they go out door to door to get reelected and August and November, they'll get killed if they haven't done the right thing and gotten a plan together that the court will accept. Well, there was an effort to recall the state Supreme Court justices last fall, and that and it failed fell, badly. It, it failed on its, on its face because, as I said, people hold the, the justices in high regard. Talk, talk for a moment about the study the Republicans in the legislature ordered that came back saying you need to spend $2 billion more on education. Well, that was a big oops. Because the, <laughs> no kidding. when the Republicans picked uh, their uh, expert, they thought they were going to come back with a study that was going to say, no, you guys are already spending too much. We know it can be much more efficient. And instead, they came back with this number of uh, up to $2 billion a year extra for the, for the schools in Kansas, which I must tell you, I'm in favor of more funding for schools. I thought that was absolutely absurd. And it's not going anywhere. It'll never even get close to that number. But it, it stopped the Republicans that, that thought they were going to have something to sell in their tracks. I mean, they had to back up and say, well, wait a minute, we're not going there. Well, I think the latest is Republicans are now saying $500 million over five years. They Democrats are saying, are it, it just came out with their, their $500 million thing out of their committee, but 
that's not going to be the final number, I can tell you that. Crosby, I think there was the implication in the study that uh, Kansas legislators ordered that spending more on education enhances student performance. Do you accept that implication? No, I, you know, we've had Eric Konishek in the library twice, who's the leading scholar on this, and there is no direct correlation of spending uh, per pupil uh, on quality. And they ought to be focused on quality. Uh, and, and it doesn't, it, ha it has a little bit to do with spending and where you spend it. Teacher quality is, is the best example. We're right in the middle. In Kansas and in Missouri, we're right in the middle of, of the United States spending and, and teacher salaries. <clears throat> and the United States is fourth or fifth in the world uh, in spending per pupil. The only, the only people who are larger than we are regularly is, is Switzerland in terms of our spending per pupil. Uh, and yet we're 20th and 21st in, uh, in science and reading. We're like something like 30th uh, in math now. Uh, so spending has nothing to do, not nothing to do with it, but not a lot to do with it. And that's the flaw in both the Supreme Court's decision making on this and also in the Republican study. Uh, yes. Teresa, you've held public office. You know how tough it is to increase taxes. Uh, that may be an option that Kansas legislators have to look at. It may be an option. I don't know if that's what they're going to move towards. It's hard to say. Um, kind of like what, what other choices do they have? Um, I think you start looking at the budget Cutting overall and, and what it looks like in general. There, there are actually, I won't go into the great detail, but there, is, there are a number of ways for the legislature to get through at least year one with something like a $300 million increase in revenue in spending without raising taxes. And, uh, and if we had more time, I would go into more detail, but just it, it's well, there. Well, they could just take a short amount of time and give us a quick overview. Well, first of all, with the change in the federal tax reform, mm. many people do not realize that there is a windfall to Kansas of $138 million a year forever, as long as that reform stays in place. And because of the income tax hike, I think the state's collecting more revenue each month. <laughs> Absolutely, they're, that's, they're way ahead. We they have, had to. They have an, it, that's right, right so, so, so that's part of it. Anyway, there's, okay, there's thank a number you. of uh, Jason, uh, is it fair to assume that school finance will be a prime topic in the legislative and gubernatorial races in Kansas? Oh, no doubt. Uh, Chris Kobach uh, for the Republicans has already said he's against it, I think. I mean, he's yeah. he's kind of becoming more popular. I, in my circles, I've talked to people really think, Steve, that he actually might win that Republican primary against the uh, current governor. I don't know. but Oh, I think he's the favorite. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I just think this issue in Kansas has been going on for so long. At some point, don't we have to just make a decision and move on? That's kind of how I feel. One would hope. Yep. No. <laughs> All right. That's not how politics works. Speaking of, <laughs> exactly, that is not. Speaking of moving on, uh, Jeff Rowe is the founder of Axiom Strategies and is one of the nation's premier political consultants. He began his career in Kansas City and got national attention for his work on the Ted Cruz presidential mm -hmm. campaign in 2016. Rowe's career may have hit his peak when he appeared several times as a panelist on Ruckus. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Anyway, Roe in a New York Times column is telling Republicans not to abandon the party in November because the midterm elections will be a referendum on President Trump even though Trump won't be on the ballot. Roe urges Republicans to focus on Trump's achievements, not his eccentricities. So, as a consultant yourself, uh, do you think Republicans will listen to this major GOP consultant, Jason? I think they have to uh, because if you look at elections and midterms, I think that the party that is in power, right, has lost pretty much all of them. Almost seats. always. They're going to lose seats, the Republicans. Yeah. The only two I could find were 2002 after 9-11 with George W. Bush and 1998. Bill Clinton, uh, the Democrats didn't lose seats, which I thought was interesting. But that was his second term, right? That wasn't his first, first term. term. So, um, yeah, I think they have to, to, to listen to it. I, you know, the whole election is going to be about Trump no matter what, right? So mm -hmm. so what do you do? You obviously accent the positives that Republicans are like, which is what he said. They're going to talk about the tax cut. They're going to talk about uh, other things that Trump has accomplished, and that's the only way they really can get reelected. And Democrats in 2010, I was one of them, maybe, we kind of backed away from the Obamacare debate because every mailer Jeff Rose sent out against me that year was me and Obama standing hand in hand. So, I mean, the point is, is that... Uh, you really have to make a decision, like you said. And so if there, there's really no good decision here, you have to just advocate for what's working for Trump. You've dealt with Jeff Rowe in the past when he was in Kansas City. Are you surprised by his meteoric rise? Well, I mean, he works I mean, he's hard. A smart, he built a business. Guy, and, yeah. you know, you got to credit a business owner for growing a business. But, yeah, I mean, he's he's always been known about kind of a brass knuckles. We saw that in the, uh, the last right. election, right, in right. 2016 uh, with uh, Ben Carson. Teresa, Absolutely, I know you've yes. done some consulting work yourself. 
Uh, do you think Republicans will likely listen to what Jeff Rose said? Yeah, I mean, look, I've worked with Jeff, too. I mean, he helped us with the zoo tax for the, the county when I was there. I mean, I've sat on panels with him. And, I mean, at the end of the day, he's, he's a sharp guy. He knows what he's talking about. And whether you like him or, or dislike him, um, he, he knows his, his stuff. Um, and so I think that that really plays out in this article that he wrote, and they should listen. I mean, we've, like, you know, like, um, like Jason. Yes, yeah, so like Jason said, <laughs> is that, um, you know, we saw that happen in 2010 with the Democrats. He, Jeff is the consultant for Kevin Yoder in the 3rd District oh, really? in Kansas. And uh, we've had several, Kevin and I had some discussions about this. And he's, and you can tell from what he's doing in his talking points that he, he's basically saying, I, I do agree with the, you know, the tax cuts. I agree with the right deregulation. Uh, all, he starts listing all these things. Then he says, I'm not in agreement with some of the things that he's done and said. For example, when he equated neo-Nazis with the other protesters, he says, I don't agree with things like that. He's, we're not 100% on board with everything, but he's embracing Donald Trump. There's no question about it. He's going full steam ahead with him, yes. for better or for worse. And it I seems, think, odd. And I think, seems odd for him. It does. It seems very <laughs> odd. <laughs> and Crosby, I know you're no fan of Donald Trump. Right. You've made that clear on this program and, and elsewhere, but... Have there been some Trump achievements that so, Republicans sure, ought to be talking about? The economy's doing pretty well. I, I would have held my nose, but I would have voted for the, the tax cut because it did some things that had to be done, though it made the, it, you know, for Republicans to make the tax code more complex was not a good thing. Yeah, um, right. And, uh, you know, and our, our, our foreign policy, uh, it, it, we, we beat ISIS. He seems to, he's going to do as well with Kim Jong-un mm -hmm. as anybody else has done, et cetera. Um, I, but, you know, he's got the worst character of any American president, just simply that. And that, and that you know, it, from a political point of view, he, is, he, he, he offends independence. And we are a 50-50 country mm -hmm. right now. And if you offend independence at the level he does, I think there's a long-term problem for the Republican Party. I'll say this. Jeff Rowe would say that they don't matter because this is a midterm, right? Right. And Republicans are going to get out and vote and Democrats are going to vote. Right. And not that the moderates aren't going to come out and vote this election. Let's talk about Democrats in the midterm. What should they be emphasizing they in should, congressional races? They should not overplay their hand on all the stuff that Crosby's talking about. Exactly. They should talk about what they're going to do to help people in red states, blue states, rural areas, cities. They should be more of a larger scale party and they shouldn't just attack Donald Trump on everything. They, they, they need more Connor Lambs. Connor Lambs. Connor, he, I was right. going to say the He reflected his district on, on guns, on abortion, right. on, other, on, on, on all the social issues, et cetera. And it's very hard for the Democratic Party to do it. So I think in the long run, the Democrats are still in trouble. But I think in the short run, the character issue does play a little more than uh, Jeff thinks. Well, especially with the national media. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, every single day it's something. And so that character um, portrayal of Trump really plays a big role. And so so how do you at the local level drum down that um, national media attention and really get to the issues at, at the heart of these uh, the districts? The problem I think the Democrats have is the left wing is controlling the party right now. And ultimately, I think the nominee is going to be too far left for the American public to accept. And that's why I think Donald Trump's in for another term. Uh, quickly, Jason, will we see gun control as a key issue in the campaign? I, I think a lot of those blue states you will. Very liberal or swing to liberal districts, you're going to see that a lot. I don't know if it's probably the smartest policy in a, in a rural state like Missouri to, to make that your issue, but someone disagree with me. I think I agree with Crosby. You have to have candidates to fit their district uh, and believe in those things, and, and they have to be authentic about it. All right, good discussion. Now we're going to head to the soapbox for Roast and Toast where the Ruckettes have 30 seconds each to address or redress people and events in the news. And we start with Crosby. So we're entering the election season for the next city council and next mayor, and I would urge everyone to think about three things. One, we have a city council that's endorsed the most undemocratic election in, in modern Kansas City uh, history. Uh, two, the subsidies of corporations have gotten completely out of control. And three, uh, we, we negotiated uh, in secret an airport deal that would have given one company 200 to 400 million dollars. The people who did that on the city council are running for mayor. Don't vote for them. All right, Teresa. So on that note, <laughs> I would just like to give a toast to all the people that got up extremely bright and early this morning to go out, stand on corners, and sell newspapers to help with some of the nonprofits around the area, um, the youth, and um, happy Greater Kansas City Day. Is that why you took a nap during the program? It is. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, uh, Jason. Uh, on a positive note, too, I want to toast uh, Clayton uh, Custer and Ben Richardson from Blue Valley Northwest High School. Two guys have been playing basketball since third grader, uh, now playing together at Loyal Chicago. 
Chicago, a great school in Chicago, uh, in the Final Four this uh, upcoming weekend. So I just, they were in the New York Times the other day. I got forward to the article. I couldn't believe the, these two guys that grew up together are now uh, playing in the Final Four. It's a pretty cool story and uh, makes you want to get out there and kind of watch your old basketball games when you were a kid and, and relive those memories. And it's opening day for the Kansas City Royals. That's right. That's right. All right I'd like to roast those who want to put on the census the question, are you a citizen? Now, 50 years ago, that might have gone over. But right now, while we're handcuffing people in their front yards, that isn't going to work. People are not. You might as well say, have, I, have you ever committed a crime and not been caught? Check the mark. And that's what people are going to not do. They're going to not, they're not going to put anything in the place, and it's going to be a complete miscount of the people who are in America. And finally, appearing at a Generation Next event, President Trump was asked this question. What would you tell a 25-year-old Donald Trump? The president's answer? Don't run for president. <laughs> Among those who probably like that answer, Senator Ted Cruz, former Senator Hillary Clinton, and several ruckus panelists who will remain unnamed. And that is Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying Happy Easter, Happy Passover. Thanks for watching, and good night.